Yeah. Well, I think that um, most of you are happy to help you out with that. Yeah. Um, just meet and talk and see what's happening. Yeah. What's the best way to do it? Cheers. 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 Cheers.
So strength through geometry is how we usually um, address the problem of designing better structures. Now, of course, you can't only just design better structures. We need to also build them better. So we tackle that with digital fabrication. Um, and that's the marriage between these two worlds that um, somehow make it possible. So one of the nicest examples of these two things coming together is the Armadillo Vault, which was built by the group in, at the Venice Biennale in 2016. Um, it looks like this. It's a um, very thin um, limestone vault. It spans about 16 meters, if I'm, not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and I do not know what that is in feet. I'm very sorry. So everything will be in meters and kilograms <laughs> instead of inches and so on, uh, and feet. Um, but it spans 16 meters. It's five centimeters uh, thin, um, and it's held together by nothing but gravity. So there is no glue, there is no mortar, there is no cement holding this together. It's just 399 blocks of limestone, so rather weak material, that are being held together by the forces, um, by the strength of its geometry. So um, the digital fabrication side of things in this means that you also need to fabricate these stone pieces quite precisely, because if you have a very thin structure, then you also need to make sure that it fits well, uh, very well together. So this was done um, in Texas. Um, then all of these pieces uh, came together. What is, very, um, what is very interesting about it is, as you can see, there is no mortar. So it has been put together several times, once in Texas to test it, once in Venice. And it's been taken apart again and can be put together again. This is what it looked like. And what you can see is that there is a, also a very interesting uh, inner surface to it that is very um, uh, rippled. And this comes actually as being informed by the fabrication process. So if you want to have a double curved surface um, that you mill out of stone, um, you would have to spend quite a lot of time passing and milling this entire surface. We wouldn't have had the time for that. So what we did here is we, um, we borrowed the technique that was employed by, um, uh, by the stonemasons in Texas, where you kind of just score it every centimeter or so, and then you can hammer it off because it's a soft, soft material, and then you get this emerging pattern. But what we wanted to do is really design that pattern, so make sure that it aligns with the force flow and really shows where that, uh, where that goes. Part of the work of making that pattern um, is uh, of this in, inside, so figuring out exactly where each line needs to go was some of the earlier work that I did with the group. And then um, that somehow feeds into the, uh, to the work of the knitting, where you also need to find a pattern for, the, uh, for it. So we address these things through structural geometry, as I said before, because that means that you can use less material. Using less material is, also, is good for sustainability, but that's not the only part. What the group does is also use a lot of funicular form that is also good structural form, meaning that you can use other materials, so very weak materials. Not only uh, use less, but weak materials. That means that you could use more sustainable materials, which are usually weaker. And finally, um, using digital fabrication, um, we can have less waste. So we can make sure that we build things also using less material. I'll be talking mostly about the first and the last. I don't do anything much with funicular form myself, so we'll be um, standing in between those two. So um, what we do is not only come up with these uh, types of methods, but we build, up, build a lot of demonstrators to show that this works. Some of them uh, deal with everything. Some of them deal with using weaker materials, as you can see here. So that's mycelium. Um, others look at how you could assemble structures um, without the need of intermediate support. So um, that's something that was done by Matthias Stiffman. Others uh, look at using so weaker material or better structural form. So these are just a couple of examples. But it's not enough just to build um, demonstrators for the things that we do. What we also want to do is share those things openly, so share the methods that we developed. And we do that through an in-house developed um, platform that is um, Compass. It's uh, open source, and uh, it's Python-based, and you can find it online on GitHub. Um, so in this context, um, the work that I do deals with the challenges associated with building complex concrete structures. Concrete. 
We love it. We use it to build a lot of complex structures. Now you could do that for two reasons. You could either do it for um, a given aesthetic reason, as you can see over there, so you would have a sort of flowing hood. Or you can do it for structural reasons. That's, that's the more interesting side of things. So you could do it out of a sort of structural performance um, um, idea where you use less material, but you have these very complex geometries as a consequence. Now, the thing that they have in common, regardless of the way that, of the reasoning behind the geometry that you have, is that they are built mostly in the same way. So you need a mold or a formwork to cast that concrete into. And that has stayed largely unchanged for the last century. So you'll have the, uh, the examples on the left and right. So what we see is that you have these kind of heavy molds um, out of timber uh, or EPS that are being uh, manufactured to form in a time-consuming way. They're held up by a lot of scaffolding. And then you use them to cast your structure. And more often than not, they go to waste. So you have a problem of, have, of weight extensive scaffolding, it's, it's a time-consuming process, it's labor-intensive, um, it's expensive, and it's wasteful. So what you, uh, what we really, why this is important is because if you look at a standard concrete structure, so something more rectangular um, shaped, um, the cost of formwork is about half of the structure's cost, of the concrete structure's cost. So if we start looking into more custom uh, things, this turns out to be more around 75% of the structure's cost. And to make things worse, that custom structure is already three times as expensive as the standard one. So um, that's a lot. That's a good reason to try to look at the formwork part of things. So ideally, what we want to do is reduce all of these, right? Now, there are solutions for this. I'm not the first person to look at this. There are many people that have looked at this. And some of those solutions um, are varied. They, look at, they can look at um, milling or cutting in a different way, so to make that a little bit more efficient or more precise. You can have adaptive molds, so they tackle the reusa reusability of a mold, so that you can use it multiple times. Uh, you can have 3D printed molds. That gives you virtual um, freedom in terms of all of the possible geometries that you want to do. And finally, there are some uh, approaches that also look into um, having stay-in-place molds. So removing the problem of taking the mold out altogether, having them stay there and being active. Now, all of those solutions tackle this problem to one degree or another, but none of them, all of them, all of the uh, problems at the same time. So a different avenue, which is um, possibly a little bit better at all of those points, is to use a flexible formwork system. And what is a flexible formwork system? It's one that uses a textile, uh, which is uh, draped or hung some, in some way. So it's shaped. It can be inflated. It can be supported by um, cable nets or splines or bending active things, or it can be just simply tensioned into a sort of rigid external frame. Um, it's a flex that's a flexible formwork system. So if you change the system from a rigid traditional formwork system to a flexible formwork system, um, you have some advantages. So you have a lot less support that you need. You have this freedom of space underneath. It's a lot lighter. Than, uh, than its counterpart, but there is a catch. You don't get anything, everything for free. So in this traditional formwork system, you can build whatever geometry you want to build. It's the brute force approach, right? So as long as you can manufacture that mold, you can make that structure that you want. In the flexible system, that's not the case. This needs to be an informed structure because you cannot build just any geometry with a flexible formwork system. But usually those geometries tend to be optimized. So the thing that is a little bit of a, uh, of a catch, I would say is, a, um, is, a dis is an advantage in disguise. Because if we want to take advantage of a system that is lighter and less wasteful, we also need to be smarter about the structures that we, uh, that we design, because we can't design just anything for it. Usually, the types of fabrics that are being used in these kind of flexible formwork systems are woven fabrics. Meaning, you have flat sheet, not because woven is only flat sheet, but that's what's being used. So you can have flat sheet material on rolls that need pat needs patterning, so you need to cut it and tailor it like you would do with clothing. It's usually single layered, so if you want to include any other sort of functionality, 
let's say, a channel, you would need to stitch two pieces together. And a woven textile is directional. So you have a zero 90 degree angle, which means it also has that kind of directional property. Now, you can see that that means that if you would take it out of flat sheets, if you want to do a um, geometry such as this, the more doubly curved and the more complex it is, the more patterning you need to approximate that shape from a flat sheet panel. So you need to stitch, uh, to stitch a lot of pieces together. And that's what you see here. On the other hand, if you use knitting, which is a different, uh, it's a different material technique, you can create the same shape, but then in one single process. So that was the inspiration for this one. And it's just to show that you can create a non-orientable surface without needing to, stick to create any single stitch. So it's just one single process to make this. Now, that is all great for having still a single layer sort of material, but if we look at architecture, what you also want to have is 3D shapes. You want them to be multi-layered. You want to be able to have openings, surface texturing, cavities. You want to be able to integrate a lot more than just having one uh, single surface. So that's where uh, knitting actually still brings some of these advantages together because you can have all of these things uh, combined. So you can have full 3D shaping. You need minimal stitching compared to other ones. You can have um, several types of architectures for these textiles. So you can have branching, you can have channels, you can have pockets, you can have openings. Um, you can have spacer fabrics. And most interestingly, you can have tailored material placing. And when I say that, I'll have you think of lace, which is the one over down here, or all of your grandmother's knitting. So you can have all of these very specific patterns that are laid out in very specific, uh, in very specific directions. And that is very uh, interesting for our application. So what would be the objective then? To have a feasible, efficient, and economic stain place knitted mold. But I've sold the knitting till now. So how this works is we start with a design. Then fabricate a fitting textile using knitting or a knitting machine. Tension that textile, so shape it somehow, and coat it with a very thin cement paste. And then use that as formwork for concrete. Now, there's one question, how to get from the design to the knitting, from your 3D design to the knitting. First, you'd have to, depending on how big your design is, you'd have to discretize this. So you'd have to split it into more manageable pieces, let's say. And then for each one of those pieces, you'd have to create a knitting pattern, which are the instructions that you sent to the machine to produce this um, custom, custom textile. Now, once you have the textile produced, you want to get from the textile to the formwork itself. And that can be approached in one of two ways. So on the one hand, you can pack the textile and send it off compactly in a box, in a suitcase, in a backpack, however, uh, however you want to look at it. Tension it on site and then use coat it and have that as a formwork. The other option would be to have a sort of prefabricated solution where you tension all of the subparts of this um, of this textile and coat it. And lightweight and compact formwork that you transport in a component sort of shape to the work site, and then you assemble that to become the formwork. Whichever way um, you choose, what comes out of it is used as a um, formwork to create a concrete structure. So let's talk about knitting then. <laughs> let's take a closer look at that. Knitting um, is um, a structure that looks like this. And I'm talking specifically about weft knitting here and not warp knitting. Um, and the interesting part about it, why it can create all of these geometries, it's because it has a unit size, which is a loop. And that unit of a loop, which is usually quite tiny, is what makes the geometry. What is characterized usually by a width um, and a height. And those two parameters are the ones that create the textile. And as you can see here, you can kind of in intuitively see that a knitted textile could be represented as a 2D grid or a 2D matrix, a topological representation. So if you want to make a flat panel, you could represent that as a matrix that looks like this, as a topology that looks like this. If you wanted to create a shaped panel, 
you'd have a topology that looks like this. So what you need to do is just be able to add or remove a loop locally where you need it. And that is done through things such as increases, and that's a, uh, a known procedure in knitting, or decreases. So taking out a loop from row to row or adding a loop from row to row. But this still makes a flat shaped panel. So the interesting part is to look at how to make a 3D panel. And if we would look at one of those, say we wanted to have this bump, you'd see that in plan you have the same matrix, but if you have the bump, the backside is actually shorter than the, the length of the backside is shorter than the length of the front side. So we need to figure out a way to introduce locally some material in between those two. And those are um, the same kind of operations. They're called short rows. So they are just local insertions of material that allow you to create 3D geometry without needing to cut and stitch. In a flat piece of material, this would require cutting and stitching pieces together. So that, those are the basics of how you get 3D geometry in knitting. Now, usually knits are created on machines that look something like this. This is one option for a, for a knitting machine. They have uh, a set of needles that are laid out next to each other in a long, uh, in a long array. And those needles pull a thread that is brought by, by a yarn guide. And you see those yarn guides moving over there. Now, it doesn't have only one set of needles. It has two sets of needles facing each other um, in a layout that looks something like this in a section. And that's how um, a loop is made. Now, the interesting part here is that in one of those processes, what you can do is you can use one thread uh, to make a loop on the one side. You can use it to make a loop on the other side. You can go front or back, so keep switching between front and back and make those connections. Um, you can use two different threads at the same time and go um, and alternate between the front and the back. So you can create a lot of different architectures for your, uh, for your textile. To do so, the machine needs a set of instructions. And th that set of instructions looks something like this. So with each pass, each one of these rows over here represents a pass of the machine. And each one of those pixels in here represents one working needle. So each one of, each one of these um, pixels in this set of instructions tells the machine what that needle at that specific point should do. When there is no instruction, so something like here, that means you have, uh, you have a short row. So that's where your uh, extra material comes from. So normally, these types of, uh, of patterns, and here you see a bit more of a full one, Normally, these types of patterns are created in a quasi-manual way by te very skilled technicians that know exactly where to place the different artifacts. So where not to have working needles, um, where to have a transfer function, where to have, so really tell every needle what to do. Now, of course, there are macros for this, but when it's not a repetitive, uh, when it's not a repetitive thing, that can be difficult. So if you'd have a sphere or a elbow type thing, we are very good at figuring out what that pattern should look like. So we really know where to place those artifacts or those short rows. But once you get to things that are not the size of our shoes or clothes or, um, or this kind of thing, and they're not also primitive, but more moving towards the realm of architecture, it starts becoming very difficult to have somebody actually come up with the pattern that will produce that geometry. And if we want to use this for construction, we need to be able to do that for a large surface and do it fast um, and do it reliably. So ideally, what you want to do is go from a 3D geometry to the exact instruction uh, corresponding geometry. And part of uh, my research was to come up with that. So the method for doing this was to start with a geometry that is then split into different patches. This is for managing it purely as a geometry. For each one of those um, um, patches, you generate all of the courses. The courses are each path of the machine. Then within those courses, generate how many loops there are, so each individual uh, needle. And then finally, and that is all done on the 3D geometry, and then finally translate that to a 2D pixel pattern representation for the machine. So how this works, just by example, is you take a, a patch, something like this, 
And you have to decide, uh, because the loops are not, the width and the height are not necessarily the same, you have to decide what your knitting direction would be. So you choose a knitting direction for your patch. And then having the information of the loop sizes, we can generate that. First, knowing the start and the end, all of the passes. But because it's not a flat geometry, not all of these passes go through. So then you'd have, um, wow, sorry. Then you'd have some, um, some short rows. So uh, the blue highlighted rows here are the ones that, um, that don't go all the way through, the short rows. And then within those, uh, start looking at how many loops you have. So we sample those with a loop, loop width um, and divide them up. Now, um, you have the same kind of problem in the other direction. So you'd have what a short row um, looks like. But there are also these exceptions in the other direction where you have an increase or a decrease, which are the same kind of thing um, in the vertical matrix. And that's what um, the pattern looks like in the end for the machine. So you can do this for one patch, and then we can do it consequently for all of the different patches of, the, of your design, of your 3D design. And those could be digitally stitched together. This is what, um, what the pattern uh, would look like with short rows, for example, for that, uh, for that leg of, the, um, of that node that I showed you, so not all the ways going through. And physically on the knits, go all the way through, but they're produced in the same way. So once we have the patterns, we have a representation between the 3D geometry and a 2D representation of it. So if you have that relationship, that means that we can also mark on that 2D pattern all of the features from the 3D model, such as placement of channels or other features that you might want to have, so openings or channels or, or things that go through. So, and you do that by marking it with a color pattern. It's a very simple coloring of the, of the diagram. So now that we have a way to make the actual knit, we want to go from the knit itself to a formwork for concrete. And that's the next step. The first experiments that I did, all of them happened on, uh, on this machine. So that was the node that you saw. It was built on, uh, on this brother hand knitting machine. Um, and it made for these kind of very lightweight nodes. Um, for example, here, um, we also looked at rib stiffeners because sometimes you cannot necessarily have only flat, uh, only very curved geometries, but when you have flatter geometries, you want to stiffen them in different ways. This is also produced only in one go, so it's looking at how, um, how oh, sorry. So this is, it's looking at how you could create these kind of stiffeners in one single process. And one of the first examples was uh, to create a small structure, a bridge. The bridge itself uh, was only 2.1 meters, so uh, again, I don't know the feet, but <laughs> it was about 200 uh, kilos and it had three meters of surface area. Uh, the knit itself was only 434 grams. That's very, very, very light. That's a pound almost, let's say. Um, and it had also 500 grams of um, GF4P rods that were used for shaping. So it's about one kilo uh, to carry 200 kilos of concrete. So um, the way we did this was uh, trying to build up strength in, uh, in layers. So uh, we had the supports, a hybrid knit textile, uh, which was coated with cement paste. And then we added some mortar and concrete. So slowly building up the strength in, uh, in layers. What's interesting about the knit, this is what it looked like, is that it had already these kind of channels that were integrated within it, where we passed some glass fiber rods through. And then we also passed some uh, aramid um, uh, cables through to shape it, so to create a sort of um, geometry. The patterns for this, though it looks a little bit flat, looked something like that. They were generated with the approach that I described before. And you can see highlighted in, uh, in pink all of the short rows that made for the shaping, so the shape of the bridge itself. And then in blue are all of the channels that go through. So there it is. There were some uh, about a week of me knitting, going back and forth, knitting this uh, this um, little bridge. You can see here also that you have already the features, so some of the holes that are in there. And as you can see, it's a little bit of a nice manual process. In the end, the three parts were only um, 
were very light, so only 433 grams. Now, the three parts were stitched together, and uh, all of the shaping elements were passed through, and then this was uh, tensioned into a rig. So um, we used the glass fiber rods to, um, to push the textile up, and we used the aramid cables to pull the textile down, making a sort of corrugated profile so that your geometry is stronger to be able to uh, create the bridge. We then coated this uh, with a thin cement paste in a climate chamber. Uh, the thin cement paste is developed by uh, Lex Reiter. He's a PhD. Well, he also just finished his PhD, so now. Um, uh, but my colleague from Robert Platt's group, so they're from the Physical Chemistry of Building Materials at ETH, and what we call, we lovingly call him the concrete magician. So he makes sure that all of these kind of coatings uh, really work. So this is a uh, very strong coating, but a very thin one, and it makes sure that the textile becomes rigid, but it doesn't move, so it doesn't deform much. Your shape stays there. Now, once, once this, uh, this very nice thin and light shape was made, we coated it with a little bit of uh, mortar, making for a four millimeter thin uh, formwork. And then basically you have your formwork, which is rigid and it didn't move, so it didn't have to deform much. And then we use that to cast on. And that's what the bridge ended up looking like. And we were very happy to also load test it um, by jumping on it. Now what I wanted to point out about it is that we had no, it is a small structure, but there was no support under here, right? It was, it was built without any sort of support from underneath. And that is very interesting in, in general, even though this is a small one. And that's like, <laughs> um, what this bridge really showed us was gave, it gave us a glimpse into a sort of different materiality. It's not something that we were looking for necessarily when we built it. But because the coating didn't go all the way through, you could see that you can now also see the textile a little bit. And you could choose to coat this, but there is some sort of nice aesthetic to it. And we wanted to also be able to express this, which we did in the next, uh, in the next project. Now, all of the experiments up until then had been done on the brother machine, as I, um, as I pointed out. But they were convincing enough to get ETH buy us a machine. So in May last year, um, we got this uh, lovely machine which is an industrial knitting machine, and we could start really scaling up to show that this could work at a, at a larger scale. So um, the last project that I wanted to show you was the Knit Candela, which we built um, last year in Mexico. It was a collaboration with uh, Zaha Hadid's um, Architects Code Group, and it was built for their first exhibition in uh, Latin America. This is what the structure looked like. It was about um, roughly six by six meters in plan and four meters height. Uh, it has a surface area of about uh, 50 square meters. I mean the textile itself, not the covered area. Um, and this was built using a cable net to tension the textile. It weighed 30 kilos and a textile that weighed 25 kilos. So 55 kilos carried five tons of concrete. Now, what is interesting about this, um, this particular shell is that it's a waffle shell, meaning that it has these cavities. So it has a thin shell with rib stiffeners in two directions. So it has these, uh, these cavities on the inside. To build it, what we did is we built a frame. And in that frame, we tensioned the textile. The textile itself, um, which you can see here, had already pockets and channels integrated within it so that we could insert the cables, uh, the steel cables that held it up. Um, in the pockets, we uh, added inflatables or balloons, which we then inflated. We then again coated everything with a very uh, thin uh, cement paste to give it that initial rigidity. And then on top of that, you cast concrete. Once the concrete has hardened, you can take away the frame, and you're left with the structure. Um, the in balloons are deflated, so you see some skeletons in there. Um, but what's interesting is that the textile stays in place. So actually what you see here, this textile that's on the inside, is what you see on the inside of the structure itself. So you see a textile, um, a textile pattern. In this case, the textile had uh, two functions. So it had a aesthetic function, the one that you would see on the inside, and it had a technical function, um, controlling where the cables went, having the inflatables, uh, inflatable balloons, and so on. 
And that means that on the one side, you didn't see all these things, but on the other side, you have these kind of openings that you see right here, where we could insert the balloons through. You have the horizontal and vertical channels. So all of the functions that were needed for it. If we take a look at the back side and the front side of the textile, you can see that they're quite different. Um, the front side has a little bit of a tighter knit, and it also just has a little bit of a, a hint as to what's happening, so a hint as to where the channels are. Whereas the back side, you see, is a lot looser, so we, we um, controlled the inflation of the balloons to one side so that it would inflate more to that side. It also had openings to register the intersections of the cables so you know where the nodes are and openings to insert those. Now, these are not two textiles stitched together. This is one single piece of textile, one process to make all of these things. So I wanted to emphasize that. Of course, the machine is only so wide, so <laughs> you cannot actually create something that is six meters wide on it. The machine is 1.3 meters wide, so we decided to take advantage of the fact that the machine is only limited in width, but you can keep on go in going infinitely long. And we divided the entire geometry into four strips. So we only have uh, four, um, four seams over the entire, uh, over the entire um, surface area. The length of the strips were 16 to 26 meters long. The patterns were generated automatically uh, using the uh, approach I described. This is just one uh, example of a four meter pattern strip. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see very much of how that looks. You can see all of the, uh, the kind of short row features that are in there, and you can see a hint of what, uh, of what types of features there are. So let's have a closer look at that. This is a zoom in of the pattern, of the pixel pattern that produces the textile. If you see the back face of the textile, you would see how that relates to it. So for example, this is what represents a horizontal channel. Those are sets of functions. Uh, that is what represents a vertical channel. This is what would represent an opening on, on the back side of your textile. Um, and ooh, I'm sorry. Um, and what is very hard to see, but you could see it, is this is a short row, so this is kind of a pinch. And if I look for it here, you might see it as kind of a pinch in there, but it's a little bit difficult to see on the picture. So um, all of those different colors meant different functions that needed to be programmed into it. So in this case, we had a uh, function where you had two different yarns, a blue and a black one for the front and the back. Um, one of the functions would make uh, two parallel textiles, so go uh, front back. The other one would switch the colors, so you would have black on the front and blue in the back. Um, you could knit on the one side and not knit on the other side, so have a float. Then you can do um, other things like knitting on the two sides and then transferring from the front to the back, um, and so on and so forth. Now, these kind of things, when you put them together in one row, you start to understand why you can uh, create these types of uh, textiles in one process. This is what one row of these kind of pixels could look like. And what you can already start seeing here is that this is what a channel or a pocket might look like because those threads intersect. Uh, what you can also see is that you can start having different densities. So whereas you can knit on every single needle on the front, you skip some on the back and you have a different density. And that's how uh, the textile for this was manufactured, the principles. Now, once we had those patterns, um, it went on the machine uh, to produce what is arguably the world's largest scarf, um, I think. Um, those were the four long strips. This is us uh, packaging them so they could be packaged very compactly. We put them into two suitcases uh, and went to Mexico. And of course, we finished this just the night before we had to leave, right? Because it's proper architecture fashion. <laughs> In the meantime, on site, um, the frame was being built, so this is what the frame looks like. Um, and we put the entire textile together. So they, we had a seamstress that, um, that sewed the four different pieces together all in one afternoon. Uh, she was very happy to not make wedding dresses for once, um, but thought we were crazy probably. Um, and then this textile could be stretched. Now, to be honest, when we had a look at this textile in that frame, we thought, wow, is this really going to make that structure? Because it looks a lot smaller than, uh, than the thing. 
Uh, we inserted all of the cables in the in the given um, in in all of their channels. You can see here, um, and then fixed all the nodes together. And when it was finally done, we took it outside, wrapped it around the mid pole of the of the frame, and hoisted it up. Um, and it, we weren't necessarily that many people because it was heavy. Again, this was 55 kilos, so about 120 pounds. <laughs> um, but we were being careful. We tensioned that, and we were relieved to see that it did stretch to what it was supposed to stretch. So our algorithms do work somehow. Um, and that's what it looked like. So um, what I wanted to point out is that there is very little support here. It's very, very light if you look at it, if you would think of what this would look like as an APS uh, milled foam mold. Um, what we also had were uh, details to control the edge so that it's a nice knew the thickness of the concrete that needed to go on. Um, and then uh, we had a lot of balloons that needed to be inserted into these pockets. And we had clown balloons because they were, um, they were really great to work with. We also had a lot of very handy assistants uh, to help us with that. And there are about a thousand balloons uh, that went into, went into it. Now, why, after those went in, uh, we coated the, uh, the thing with a very thin cement paste. That's Lex doing his magic again. Um, and we ended up with this very nice Swiss chocolate. So um, all of these are the pockets with balloons, and they make up the cavities in the structure, right? So that's, that's the relationship between the two. Um, all of those pockets make all of these different cavities inside the concrete structure. What is also very interesting to point out about it is that there were a thousand balloons. They were a thousand of the same size balloon, standard clown balloons uh, that we used. But all of the different pockets are different sizes. And normally what you have with uh, digital fabrication and mass customization is that you can make um, whatever geometry, however different from each other, because a machine doesn't care. However, that diversity comes with a problem of logistics later on, where you need to label everything and make sure that every single part goes into the right place. In this case, that intelligence is handled by the textile itself, and it comes off of the process. So we didn't need to worry about which part we inserted where and which cable we inserted where. The textile took care of that, because it controlled how, the, how this thing uh, inflated, using the same standard element. Um, then concrete was passed onto it, so we uh, we had this done on on there. Um, now I have to say that we it was in Mexico, and this would not have been possible anywhere else. Uh, Mexico has really fantastic concrete workers. They have this manually, so they really really made a very 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 beautiful finished structure, incredibly smooth and really impressive. Um, but that is something that they also found interesting because you kind of give them a new canvas to work onto and not the usual, um, not the usual formwork. So um, what you don't see on the pictures and what you don't see on the video is that the surface here is actually soft. All of those cavities are behind the behind the textile. So if you push against it, you would uh, you would um, feel the softness, whereas um, the outside is hard. So. That's what the structure ended up looking like. And you have this nice dialogue between the hard outside and the soft inside, and seeing some of the balloon skeletons every now and then through it. But there are also some interesting parts to it. The formwork itself, so if we exclude the frame, the timber frame, that you could reuse, or you could think that it could be, uh, in a different iteration, be made out of more standardized elements that are reused, um, cost only. 2,500 francs, which is about $2,500, so that's one to one. Um, and that is for 50 square meters. That is very cheap. The textile itself only weighs 25 kilos. That is incredibly light, and we took it there in our suitcases. It took 36 hours to knit the 50 square meters, and it would, it would have taken about 750 hours to mill a similar surface area. Um, considering that you would be able to mill this geometry or make it that way. So it's a rough estimation. Um, and then the entire project from the beginning of the design, so from the first call actually, to the structure standing there, 
was three and a half months. Now remember the 750 hours I said before, that's about three months. So we would not have able, been able to do that in three and a half months using traditional techniques. It's really enabled by the process itself. So there are some advantages to this kind of uh, to this kind of approach, there is some geometrical freedom in certain in certain ways. You can have custom custom functional integration, fast fabrication. Um, it's light and compact. Um, it can simplify logistics in some ways. It's economic and it has um, rather minimal waste. So, what is even more interesting about it is that. Well, that knitting machine I showed you before, there are hundreds of them in factories such as these all over the world. So we only need to send them the instructions. You don't even need to knit it and fly it over and bring it somewhere. You just need to send them the knitting instructions to create this. So with that, I want to um, thank you. And um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sorry? Is the geometry of the, the Nick Mandela an anapher surface? Um, sorry. No, no, you, 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 oh. um, so you asked if it's an anapher surface? Yeah. Um, honestly, I don't know. No, it's just an anti classic geometry. <laughs> it's, a, it's form found so that the um, um, so that the cable net would work. Um, it's um, so no, I I don't know. No. <laughs> Mm -hmm. with what's available here. And we're looking at block, there's definitely a sort of, it makes, it makes one salivate to look at the limited resources you guys have and a lot of the endeavors that you guys get up to. And I'm just wondering for, for someone in, in our position, how can we get involved? How can we, um, and what's our, what's our path for someone over here to, to get involved with what you guys are doing? Uh, wow, that, that, is a, that is an interesting question. but. Um, I would say that um, you definitely should be computational. I think computation is very important in architecture and in engineering and in absolutely everything. Um, and I guess I don't have to convince anybody of that. Um, so be computational, learn how to code, <laughs> um, understand structures. I think, uh, and it's not only me that thinks that obviously, uh, I come from a group that is whose prerogative is that, but there is a certain balance between being smart about structures and understanding that and using that in architecture and actually um, a structural engineer and an architect in the end have the same goal. They want the most elegant solution. And the most elegant solution can be both aesthetic and structural. And usually they, a beautiful um, structural solution is also an elegant architectural one. So I would say be aware of structures um, and then try to be smart about that. And I think you guys are. So it's <laughs> um, combine those um, and use smart tools uh, and make sure that uh, it works in the broader context so that uh, there is a reason behind it and that uh, we do try to make for a better, more sustainable world. I don't know if that Um, yes, we made a mock-up that was uh, one to one of one of the parts, um, a section over here somewhere, about two by three quads, let's say. Um, and that was done for calibration purposes also to see what, uh, what the textile should be like, if the stretch is good enough, if we can spray it, if we can make the pockets, if we can... So there are, there's a lot of prototyping involved in something like this, actually, in the development process. 
Uh, there are a lot of prototypes for the system itself, but then, yes, the, the mock-up as well. Um, the, I, I don't have a very clear uh, line of thought now as to what the exact lessons are, but all of those specific prototypes led to the system that works in the end, so you do learn through prototyping. Um, figuring out what the exact density should be so that your concrete doesn't come through and then you do have a clean surface. Um, knowing how taut your textile should be um, so that it doesn't interfere with the load-bearing cable net. Uh, because if it's too tight, then it's going to pull on your cable net so it's never going to reach the geometry. If it's too loose, it, it's not going to control anything and it's going to start sagging. So those kind of things are all calibrated through computation and through prototyping, so through figuring these kind of things out. Yes, I'll go to the back and then I'll come. Uh, I was wondering what the potential, I mean, is this clear potential for some of the formal, formal forms that you're showing, but what is your conclusion now as to its potential for conventional uh, architectural <coughs> forms and, and construction forms as well as so planar surfaces, mm -hmm. and since you're working with a hybrid material and two components of very diverse temporalities, what is your hunch as to how this might be applied in, in a more conventional context? I mean, is this just a formwork that is coded to be protected from the elements and to have a sort of finish that is more commensurate to the concrete? Or um, nice. So um, I'll be bold and I'll say, um, well, we should be moving away from the conventional because it's not serving us very well <laughs> in the world. Um, so um, let's say we will not keep building the same way we build now in 30 years from now, or I hope we won't be. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to have uh, crazy double curved surfaces that we don't know where up and down is and where you, so I'm not saying that. Uh, but you will have more uh, complex geometries. Um, there's nothing to say that you can't use this in a sort of more um, traditional setting. Of course, these are more extreme geometries that kind of showcase what your, what your system looks like. Um, we do... Um, um, such as a funicular floor, for example. So that's that's a floor slab. It just has a very uh, different uh, geometry, but it's still used as a floor slab. I would argue that we have very good solutions for creating um, a rectangular straight wall with a... So I'm not proposing that this is an alternative for that, because we have good solutions for that. And it's probably not the, the most efficient way of building a straight wall either. Um, but in terms of being able to build those special geometries that allow us to have material saving, it is. So I think there's a, there's a dynamic there between what is traditional and what traditional will become. Um, so it can be used. Then, um, yes, you are right. Um, this is not necessarily durable. You could cut the textile and it's, uh, and it's ruined as an inner surface. Of course, that would mean that it could be coated. Actually, it started from um, it should be coated, so it would be it would be enclosed. It's a formwork, uh, but we decided to also explore the aesthetic possibilities of having this. You could have stronger materials, coated materials. What I find more interesting is to really look at uh, other functions that you could integrate into it. So you could have lighting, you could have sensors, you could have some sort of um, other functionality that comes into it. If it's in an, in an indoor space, so in a sort of indoor um, uh, uh, setting, then the durability is already a little bit uh, better addressed. So in a sort of outside setting, that is, um, that is different. I don't know if that answers your question, but yes. A commingled yarn. Yes. A commingled yarn with resin, you mean? Um, yeah. So, um, no, that's one of the, we haven't used that. Um, now, there are some reasons for it. One of, we are looking into how, in, into those kind of things. 
in this case, it's kind of uh, also the beauty of the system that you have cement and concrete and everything going um, being out of the same material. You will also not really compete in cost with the cement when it comes to re so a resin will be already way way more expensive than any sort of cementitious material um, and perhaps also less sustainable it depends I don't know I'm not going to make many um, claims about that but yes uh, we are looking into how that could be done also with uh, bioresins and other things and commingled yarns that wouldn't be necessary so we have to look into how strong that would be Sure, but that's not necessarily strong enough. We don't know that. So you want to, you want to, the coming of yarn is also very, very thin usually. So it will harden it. And we, we are actually thinking of, of looking into that and into looking how you can coat it with, um, with resins actually. Mostly because we're, we're thinking of using it as reinforcement possibly. So uh, here it's a lost formwork, but if you start using technical yarns, then you can have it as reinforcement, but then um, that doesn't work as well with cementitious materials. It depends. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, your knitting graphics are major. Like, honestly, you're next, the most next level as ever. So thanks for making it. <laughs> no, for real, because a lot of like knitting infographics aren't uh, you know, that it's most easy to digest and Thank you. Skills. Okay, the, the, I have a long answer to that one. <laughs> um, so on the one hand, the answer is um, what we are already starting to do. So um, this um, research is going into a, uh, a project in, the, in a bigger project in the NCCR, so in the National Center for Research in Digital Fabrication, uh, where we're working together with roboticists, with structural engineers, with material scientists, and um, to uh, look at how you can uh, use it as reinforcements. That's one of them. Uh, so that's interesting because then it's not lost. Then you can also eliminate the steel and so on. Um, we're looking at how you could um, make, how you can spray it with a spray, have more automatic spraying techniques. So uh, drone spraying is <laughs> one of the one of the things there. Um, we. We keep working with um, with material scientists on the material side of things, so on the cement based or not the cement based. Um, and actually, the interesting part would be how to make it a properly deployable structure, because at the moment you still have this frame, which is still custom made for this kind of structure. So if you would have it, think of the bridge more of into it. So already inside of the structure, deployable and it stays there. There's a lot less waste and it's a lot better to do. Um, what I'm very, besides all of that, uh, I think what is very interesting is to really look at the um, uh, at all of the other features that you could integrate within it, um, at kind of the um, um, also the types of materials. So um, you can go more into the sort of uh, sustainable materials that can be used with it, um, the types of aesthetics, but also the kind of functions that you might integrate into. So having lighting, having sensors, having um, whatever you can think of in that sense. So um, knitting itself would not does not necessarily does not have a geometrical constraint. That's a little bit bold, but it does not have a let's say it does not have a geometrical constraint theoretically. Um, so you can knit almost whatever you want to knit. Now that doesn't mean that the geometry that so that is not a the fabrication is not a constraint for the geometry itself necessarily. Uh, but the types of geometries that you can make with a tensile system, so tensioning something, um, are constrained. So you need, at the very least, to have an antiplastic surface. So it means 
a negative Gaussian curvature, it means you need to have a sort of saddle shape or something like this. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that a saddle shape or a anticlastic geometry is automatically an optimized geometry, but you do need it to be an anticlastic kind of surface to be able to create it with a textile or a tensile system, so that's one of the considerations. Um, and then you could have an optimized one. So the, uh, the surface is, um, yeah, the same thickness throughout, um, but it is form found so that you can build it with a tensile cable net. Yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, well, I would like to thank you for this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am. I'm always fascinated by stories that start with an ego and end up in a physical. Um, and we tend to tell these stories in a linear fashion, but mm -hmm. it's a physical object. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also really interested about how the story wraps up back into the author and into the design. And is there a thinking process? So my first question would be: You, as one of the masterminds of this project, what do you think you have to learn yourself, or what have you discovered? Right. And then my other second question would be a little bit in the lines of what was asked before. So what is, what can you give us, what can you teach us about what's next for you in your career? Okay. Um, I find that a very tough question, what, I, what I've learned, because usually you learn a lot, and I'm sure I've learned a lot, but it's very hard to uh, think about uh, what was it exactly that, uh, that you've learned. Um, I think... Um, there are, um, there are quite a few uh, moments that you go through in a project like this that, that are indeed not really that linear. You might start with uh, a certain idea and then, uh, and then prototype it and then figure out that it looks better this way or that way. Um, I, I find that a very tough question. Such a tough question. <laughs> it's almost an unfairly tough question. No. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I've learned that you have to have some patience with yourself and you have to have some patience with the kind of uh, things that you design. Um, that sometimes, um, yes, the story is very easy to tell, but the, but the path to get there is not necessarily always as straightforward. Um, I'm not doing a good job at answering your question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> because I'm, I promise in half a year I'll know exactly what I learned from it <laughs> other than the, the clear ones but um, for me well I'm staying as a postdoc so there's more research on this stuff uh, we're, uh, we're building um, another pavilion um, it's going to look into um, other materials into uh, different materiality it's going to use some resin and some concrete and kind of a mixture of this. It's going to use also different types of yarns and different types of uh, materials, and it's very exciting. Um, it was um, interesting because the, the Nit Candela is not there anymore. It was demolished in July. Uh, it was always meant to be a temporary installation, but a lot of uh, in the courtyard of the museum. So we went in there with a backpack and a very light package, and we left five tons of concrete that they needed to figure out how to get out. So what I've learned is that uh, a lot of people wanted to keep this somehow and they needed to figure out a way to get it out, which would have been with a gigantic crane and so on. Uh, but it turns out that it would have been more expensive to take it out than to just demolish it and build a new one. So perhaps we will be able to build a Nitcandela 2.0. Um, and that is very exciting as well to take it to the next, um, to the next iteration. Well, please let me... Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.